All right. Uh, well, we're back here uh, trying to trying to get, make it through the uh, Civil War unit here. Uh, part one, we finished up uh, with part one um, uh, over on the in the Eastern Theater. So um, we're gonna we're gonna move to a different part of the country now. Uh, you know, the war is, is essentially operating in two theaters: the Eastern Theater, which is uh, east of the Appalachian Mountains between the Appalachian Mountains and the coast, the you know the Atlantic Seaboard, um, and and by the way, much of that fighting going on in Virginia, most of the fighting in the war taking place in the South. Uh, and then we've got the Western Theater, which is the territory, primarily the territory between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. So not what we would think of as the far West today, but certainly uh, the Western Theater here in the Civil War. Um, this is the part of the war, uh, or this is the this is the part of the unit that's going to get us... Um, where we're going to introduce uh, Ulysses S. Grant, okay? Um, Ulysses S. Grant is not uh, in overall command in the Western Theater. That uh, would fall to Henry Halleck. He's the major general uh, of the Western Theater. However, U.S. Grant uh, is becoming the most successful general uh, in the West. Uh, he's had a little bit of success in some minor battles uh, uh, before... Before February 1862, where we're going to pick up today, um, and so Henry Halleck, uh, over the course of the war, will have kind of a, a strained relationship with Grant. Uh, some would suggest it's uh, due to jealousy over Grant's uh, the success that Grant is having, and the notoriety that'll come with it. Um, but we'll we'll continue to see kind of this this struggle uh, between the two. Well. Uh, Grant, uh, you know, the, the, the two objectives here, or, or the, I should say the main objectives in the West um, for, for, the, for the Union is going to be, and, and, and Grant will spearhead this, uh, will be to gain access and control of the major modes of transportation for the Confederacy railways, uh, you know, railroads, and uh, in particular towns like Corinth, Mississippi, which is a major railroad hub, um, and also to gain control of the Mississippi River uh, so that they can cut the Confederacy in half, separate uh, that area west of the Mississippi from that area east of the Mississippi. That's a, uh, that's a huge point. We'll remember also that that was a major component of Winfield Scott's original uh, plan for the war, or the Anaconda plan. So, uh, in in an effort to uh, to start this this campaign uh, to the south, um, Grant has his eyes set on two uh, Confederate forts: one on the Tennessee River, Fort Henry, and the other on the Cumberland River, Fort Donelson. Uh, these are going to be two battles that take place relatively rapidly or in, in quick su succession. Um, you've got Fort Henry, you'll see right here, very close by land to Fort Donelson in the, in the northern part of Tennessee. So Grant's going to move south. Uh, he's going to make quick work of Fort Henry on Feb uh, February 6th. Uh, the fort is poorly defended. It's in a very low a low-lying area. Uh, much of the fort will be underwater uh, during this during this battle, and so it's quickly conquered. Uh, those that aren't taken prisoner or become casualties will retreat uh, to the safety of Fort Donelson. Um, Grant will leave the Tennessee, uh, take his forces overland to the short jaunt over to Fort Donelson and lay siege on Fort Donelson. Uh, takes a takes a little longer for Fort Donelson to fall. It's in a better location. It's uh, more easily defended. Um, however, uh, it won't be long before uh, the command structure within Fort Donelson will decide that <clears throat> their chances of any kind of success here are very limited. Um, and those uh, many, many uh, of those inside of Fort Donaldson will be taken prisoner. Uh, those that are not and are able to retreat will head south, uh, headed for um, headed for the area around Corinth, Mississippi. Um, that's where, after the uh, the campaigns of uh, the battles of Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, that's where the Confederate armies will make uh, make their stand. Okay, under Albert Sidney Johnston, uh, the command of Albert Sidney Johnston. <clears throat> Looking to continue his move to the south, 
uh, Grant will continue to make his way down the Tennessee River. Henry Halleck, uh, sometimes charged with being overly cautious, will instruct Grant to uh, not continue all the way to Corinth, but instead to halt his move somewhere in the, in the area of Pittsburgh landing on the Tennessee. Um, his idea is that in order to, uh, to be more successful, uh, Grant should add to his numbers an army under Don Carlos Buell. We talked about that quite a bit in class. But Don Carlos Buell, it's going to take some time for Don Carlos Buell uh, to reach and to kind of rendezvous, rendezvous with, uh, with Grant. And so uh, Grant's instructed to, um, to, to make camp at Pittsburgh Landing on the Tennessee. Um, and that's going to bring us uh, to really the first major battle uh, in the Western Theater. <clears throat> Um, Grant will, of course, stop at Pittsburgh Landing. It's about 20 miles short of Corinth. Uh, they set up camp. Um, Grant's army will spread out throughout the area. Um, there's, a, there's a small church. It's not a very populated area, but there is a small church near Pittsburgh Landing uh, called Shiloh, and that's, of course, where we'll get the name of this battle. Um, in the meantime, uh, you've got a Confederate army sitting back 20 miles, uh, 20 miles to the south uh, under Albert Sidney Johnston, uh, fully expecting to have to defend uh, Corinth from a frontal attack by the Union forces. Uh, that never comes, or at least it's not going to come for a while. So what do they do while, uh, while one, you know, while the, un while the Union is, is encamped Union forces are encamped at Pittsburgh Landing, and the Confederate forces are defending Corinth. Um, well, they'll keep an eye on each other, mainly through the use of cavalry uh, units. Um, Peachy de Beauregard, our, our buddy from out east, uh, is now being sent to the west uh, to, to kind of assist Albert Sidney Johnston, mostly because there was a really strained relationship between Beauregard and President Jefferson Davis. So in order to get Beauregard kind of out of his immediate immediate view, uh, Davis will send Beauregard out west. Uh, that leads Albert Sidney Johnson to start questioning, you know, the command he has. Is, is Beauregard being sent out there to take his place, or what's the deal? Uh, you know, Johnston soon learns that that's not the case, and will take on Beauregard as his second in command. Beauregard is a, a pretty uh, pretty accomplished military thinker. He'll bring he'll devise a plan uh, to go on the offensive and attack the Grant's army at Pittsburgh Landing. Once that plan is drawn up and and plans are are put in place, uh, they'll launch that attack in the days leading up to April sixth. It's been a rainy period out in the in the Western Theater, and so the roads are muddy. Very difficult moving an army, particular in particular artillery pieces. Very difficult to move down muddy roads. However, uh, the the roads dry up just enough uh, for Johnston's army to be able to make it to the outskirts, or or to the to the area just outside of uh, Union camps. On the morning of April sixth. The Confederates will launch their attack, completely a, a complete surprise attack on the Union, uh, on the unsuspecting Union forces. Uh, they'll catch many of them uh, sitting around the, the campfire drinking their morning coffee. Some have not even awoken yet and are still kind of uh, working their ways out out of their tents. Um, and uh, that first day of battle uh, at Shiloh will will not go very well for the Union. Uh, from the very beginning, they'll endure wave after wave of Confederate attacks, pushing them further and further uh, towards Pittsburgh Landing. Um, try to pull up a, a map here for you. Give me a, a one second. So we see the situation here uh, on the morning 
of the 6th. Uh, we can see Pittsburgh Landing is right in here. Shiloh Church, just so that we can kind of uh, kind of see where this battle will move on the first day. This is Shiloh Church. We can see that these blue lines, these are the Union positions. Uh, you know, basically where they had been encamped. Uh, the attack will come in the direction of these red arrows. And as I said, it will be wave after wave of attack, both sides, uh, you know, uh, with with casualties piling up on both sides. But the Confederates will conti continue to push. They will continue to push uh, throughout the day until until the point in the afternoon where we have a situation that looks like this. Remember where Shiloh Church was in the first uh, in the first map. Here's Shiloh Church now. So all of these areas here that had been camps uh, for Union Union forces have now been completely overrun. They've literally pushed the Union forces back into kind of a U-shaped defensive, uh, just about ready to finish them off and push them into the river, uh, as had been the original plan. Um, uh, during we see Beauregard there instead of Johnston. Uh, what happens at, at as we're approaching the afternoon? Uh, Johnston is is really trying to to finish this battle here on the first day. Really wants to make uh, make this a stunning victory, um, and is urging his forces on. Uh, and in doing so, he gets a little too close to the front, more uh, a lot closer than than commanding generals uh, usually like to be. Uh, he'll be on his horse. He'll sustain a a gunshot or or a wound to his knee. He doesn't think at first that it's very serious, but within minutes he'll fall from the saddle, uh, and it'll be soon realized that the musket ball severed his femoral artery, and it won't be uh, it won't be very long from then just a few a few minutes before Johnston is dead on the battlefield well that leaves us with PGT Beauregard now in command and uh, just uh, inexplicably uh, at not long not long from uh, I guess I guess in the early early evening uh, Beauregard calls a halt to the fighting uh, the guns fall silent along the Confederate lines and uh, what we have is um, what we have is Beauregard claiming victory before the job had been finished. Uh, he sends a, a, an order out uh, congratulating his men on a glorious victory and says we'll finish them off in the morning. Well, of course, uh, as the night wears on uh, and both sides are, tr are 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 planning for the next day's uh, operations, Don Carlos Buell's Don Carlos Buell's army will show up on the scene and very close to doubling the size of Grant's forces uh, that remain at the end of day one. Uh, so when day breaks on the 7th, the situation has completely changed. Uh, we'll, now have, <clears throat> we'll now have a situation where um, we'll now have a situation uh, where the Union is in a position to to push back the Confederate uh, Confederate forces. Um, in the end, uh, the Confederate forces will be sent scurrying back in the direction of of Corinth. Uh, it'll be um, up to this point uh, the bloodiest battle, the most costly battle in American history. Uh, we'll be left with about 23,000 23, casualties, uh, a significant number of those uh, dead on the battlefield. Many more will die in the days following from uh, infection, disease, and so forth. Uh, many more will be uh, taken from battle because of their injuries. Um, but it's a great victory uh, for U.S. Grant. Uh, and he really steals victory from the jaws of defeat. Um, there will be lots of uh, lots of criticism of of Grant following this battle that uh, it, because of the the high cost that was incurred, um, but at the end of the day, it is a it will be the most significant uh, success that the Union has enjoyed thus far in the war. All right. Well, the next time I, I jump back in here in the next video, we'll move back on over to the east and pick up uh, operations there. Until then, I'll see you in a few.